Do I think he's not doing something though to enhance his hematology, to enhance his oxygen carrying capacity, to enhance what he's doing on the field from a um, force production aspect? Like, of course, I would think he is probably implementing So guys, Derek, more plates, more dates.com. Today we are going to be talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. Yes, this is a highly requested topic. And the reason why this has come on my radar again, like it's been requested for a while, but specifically this article, what is Cristiano Ronaldo's staple diet? No Coke and all water. And, you know, notably you see him here with the fucking dicey serratus, the lean dialed in six pack. Guys just peel it out of his goddamn mind. Showing it off, he's just coming off the field mid stride and just like, boom, look at my fucking diceness. And um, he has an interesting diet model to say the least. Um, and it's like a joke in it fucking self. It is chicken, broccoli, and rice apparently. Interestingly, his teammate at Juventus, Dauda Peters, who made his debut last season against Cagl Cagliari, gave I feel like fucking calamari now. Gave an insight as to what the former Manchester United attacker eats. He always eats the same thing. Broccoli, chicken, and rice. Peters told HLN. Agua only, bitch. Goal India. Fucking diced. Look at these cap delts, bro. Vascularity out of his goddamn mind. Got the perfect fucking tan. Looking like a fucking... <laughs> looking like... <laughs> he looks fucking good, dude. So the Belgian further confirmed that Ronaldo isn't into soda drinks and intakes, doesn't drink, he intakes agua water at regular intervals to keep himself hydrated. Liters of water, no Coca-Cola. Cristiano wants to win always and everywhere. He makes young players grow. He really involves you, said the 22 year old Belgian. While some critics point that Ronaldo's obsession while main with maintaining himself in top condition is born out of vanity or narcissism, Peters disagrees and shared his reasons for the same. He does not do those abdominal exercises out of vanity, but because he sees his body as an instrument for work. It is not the case that Cristiano stands in front of the mirror during those hours. Anyway, he would not have time for that when he's at the club. It's mainly for training. He really lives for his job. Cristiano is a very nice guy, but at the same time, he takes football very seriously. So anyway... Obviously, the uh, chicken, broccoli, and uh, rice diet is a classic in the you know celebrity space. We all pretty much know what that means at that point. You're basically saying you're on the goddamn Sazul. Like, you might as well fucking just say that instead of saying you're on chicken, broccoli, and rice, which is sort of a joke. But it's like, what, uh, like, this is going to be sort of a natty or not and getting into some of the drug test parameters of um, the Champions League, Premier League, etc. You know, obviously Ronaldo being uh, on Juventus. So obviously, you know, very similar drug, drug test parameters across the board and uh, where Ronaldo competes specifically, we're gonna be kind of looking. We're going to be looking at that mainly as well as relating it back to what he's probably doing or could be doing in order to make this progress. Because if you look at him back in 2004, he has made significant progress. Like this is physique currently looking pretty fucking juicy, but this is him back in 2004. So literally 17 years ago, he looked like this in his, you know, peak testosterone levels, prime fucking ability to grow. And now in his, he's closing in on 40, you know, he's not, uh, you know, a young spry fucking, you know, test like infused goddamn to the brim stud of a male anymore well i guess he is but i mean he's not you know peaked anymore he is on the slow decline hormonally not substantial enough to to be a detriment to his physique development though apparently or his performance because he's still fucking killing it and he has significantly more muscle than he used to so how do you explain that when he is this much older and yet his physique is developed now obviously the first go-to basic fucking logical conclusion is that the guy started lifting. The guy is taking his job very seriously. He knows that having some more muscle can help him. So he starts taking up lifting seriously and ends up packing on some tissue. How much muscle did he really gain from here to here? You know, maybe 10, 10 pounds of muscle, 15 pounds of muscle at the most, something like that, I would imagine. He's obviously made decent gains, but this is within the realm of realistic for being a natural, you know? Presumably, when he came into the league, he was probably, you know, 
just a sick soccer player and didn't really do anything to uh, beef up. He was probably just fucking playing soccer and enjoying it, and that's it. And then as he started to dial in, as you know, one of the best players in the world, he probably started to incorporate other things into his game, including, I imagine, resistance training became a far more crucial staple in his routine than it was way back when he was like 20 years old or whatever this is. So anyways, as far as the drug test parameters and whatnot, is this guy in fact natural? What is the likelihood that, you know, guys are doping and he's just totally natty and he's like the top athlete in the fucking world, essentially? Let's get into it. So anyways, we're looking at the UEFA drug test parameters here. And I found the first thing I found interesting is to illustrate the breadth of UEFA's testing work in the 2015-16 season, 2,242 samples were collected within the framework of the UEFA Euro 2016 testing program. And a total of 2,542 samples were collected by UEFA in its other club and national team competitions. So we're talking about the 2015-2016 season, 2,242 samples. It's like, how many players are actually in the fucking league that Ronaldo is in? And how many samples were actually collected from those players? Like when you actually break it down, numbers wise, it seems like these guys are getting tested a few times a year at the most. And that would be generous. And interestingly enough, like as I've started to kind of dig into this shit more over the years, I've started to have more like specialized individuals within some of these professional sports leagues reach out to me to give them to give insight on kind of what's going on to go above and beyond, you know, my dissection slash slash expertise in this area. And um, I had one individual from uh, the Premier League who had a pretty close eye on things reach out to me. And he gave me some insight. And interestingly enough, the amount of times the athletes got tested um, corresponded with my, you know, rough ballpark guesstimations. It was about two to three times a year. As far as PED usage, it was not, you know, that widespread, at least, you know, according to him. Uh, but again, you have to keep in mind, this is a guy who's not literally, he's in the trenches, but he's not like the guy who is specializing in pharmacology. You know, in general, most, you know, high tier athletes are going to have a team who is essentially responsible for optimizing their performance when it comes to diet manipulation, lifestyle changes, pharmacology, chemistry, hormonal interventions. This sort of shit is like tasked to a specialist, not a, you know, a physiotherapist or a fucking chef or something like that. Like obviously the chef does the diet part maybe, but you know what I mean? So anyways, this guy is kind of going from the perspective of a guy who's an insider, but not the literal guy who's doing the pharmacology but anyway this was his perspective ped usage isn't that widespread um you know the stories would get out, get out very quickly and people with newspapers would pay you know top dollar for those those stories or you know news outlets and whatnot however he's under the impression that players are probably micro dosing bioidenticals at a top level and there was interestingly enough what appears to be many therapeutic use exemptions according to him now how common are therapeutic use exemptions for you know trt and shit like that in sports it depends on the sport you know of some of them it's like very very impossible to do like in the ufc you know it's not like you can get a tue for trt anymore whereas you know a handful of years ago you could just be fucking cranked to the tits on trt you know and uh basically get away with uh being on a mild cycle like all the time essentially um, now other sports have not cracked down the same way that the UFC has and made it way more stringent. And there's a lot of leeway, um, in some aspects. And that's above and beyond like, that's just getting a piece of paper exemption essentially for actually legally taking fucking tests against your opponents. Whereas they're not doing it or, you know, may not have as high of a, I don't know, as good of resources and or connections to kind of uh, facilitate getting this kind of coordinated and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the, uh, therapeutic use exemptions apparently allowed players to get, you know, very interesting treatments multiple times, um, usually going out of, uh, the country for treatments, you know, anonymously, or, you know, not having it really on the record so much. Um, any club doctor can fill these in and pretty much blag it, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> So as long as we know what a player's taking and can get a therapeutic use exemption for it, high test equals doctor can claim treatment for sexual dysfunction, the chances of a player being banned is very small. 
So as you would expect, you know, some of the same peptides are kind of part of the regimen, you know, the BPC-157, stuff like that, that is not on the banned list, but is still used, not in performance enhancement, but for recovery, um, injury, like accelerating injury recovery and whatnot, um, kind of, uh, I don't know, armoring the athlete against potential, uh, you know, damage that could ensue during a match. Kind of shit that you would expect, you know, certain nootropics, certain recovery agents. And again, when you get into the bioidenticals, though, that's mainly where we're looking at the performance enhancing components of exogenous anabolics, things like EPO, things like growth hormone, things that are very hard to detect for, especially when an athlete is being tested randomly only a couple times a year. And it seems like it is very much centered around this season rather than the off season, you know, and especially with the you know what that happened this last year there was even more lax testing when it already was not that stringent to begin with. Um, this guy has no doubt some of the older players are on TRT. Um, think, and again, I'm just kind of you know going off of some anecdotes from, I thought this was worth bringing up and I'll you know tie it into my own scientific insight after. Obviously this is more just a personal opinion by this guy who had insight on the Premier League specifically. We supposedly abide by WADA guidelines, but apart from a few examples, there hasn't really been significant interest or suspicion. So I don't think there's huge motivation by the governing body to get involved. I and mean, then I asked kind of, you know, how often he saw people get tested, you know, how random was it? Where did it occur the majority of the time? Um, he said that he's never seen a single time that the testers showed up at a player's house. Occasionally they'd show up at training but that would be like once a season. On average, there'd be you know two to three a year, which considering most teams play approximately 50 to 70 games a year, depending on performance, that really is not much. We were required to let the Football Association know player whereabouts for a two hour window every day so they could randomly test, but we forgot on a semi-regular re We forgot on a semi -regular basis and never had any blowback off of it. Players would normally have six to eight weeks off over the off season and pretty immediately fly out to either LA, Miami, or Dubai. We'd completely lose them for a few weeks and there's no way the doping authorities would know where they are. Theoretically, if you had a bit of knowledge about you, you could, could you run TRT through the season and blast super physiological amounts in the off season? Yes, I mean, I imagine if you made it particularly obvious you would be regularly tested, but with a bit of ingenuity could get around it. Examples, David DeGia, Goretzka, Ronaldo are a few examples of players suddenly growing in the off season a few years into their career. Although Ronaldo is genuinely the hardest working athlete out there, so no doubt his achievements are down to 100% graft and commitment. All in all, I think the testing program is awful and doesn't need to be. They could easily request bloods in the preseason, midseason, and post for the squad and randomly test efficiently, but they aren't fussed. On top of that, there's no way to really know. Players aren't microdosing if they're just about within the realms of norma normality and for any mistakes, therapeutic use exemptions are possible unless it's really ridiculous. So he's basically saying that not only do you have the leeway of you're barely being tested, even if you are, it's very lax. And he mentions here how most of the time it seemed like it was just urine testing. They were foregoing blood testing, even though that's what they need for their biological passport that they claim they use religiously. Um, and then above and beyond that, even if you got popped past the red flags of, you know, a TDE ratio above and beyond the carbon isotope ratio testing, supposedly a therapeutic use, use exemption is something that has been, you know, thrown up in the, uh, you know, among some of the camp doctors and whatnot. So anyways, that was kind of the extent of, you know, what he had discussed with me. I thought it was worth bringing up just because you know, for an anecdote from somebody like in the trenches. But as far as my personal insight, so relating it back to Ronaldo, relating it back to, you know, what you could get away with, not very many tests occurring. You know, it's very rare that Ronaldo is uh, tested, to be honest, you know, even related to the overall test per year. Um, and given the fact that it seems like the focus is mainly around the season and the off season, you pretty much can go off the radar to some extent. Um, in addition to that, bioidenticals, how easy is it to pick up in testing through urine analysis? It depends, you know? Again, if you're using exogenous TRT, you have a fairly significant leeway depending on your biological predispositions through the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio and other steroidal module ratios, which I don't know how stringently they're even looking at them or if they're even implementing it to begin with or if they're looking for basic 
Um, synthetic anabolics through GCMS testing and whatnot, which is kind of the standard rudimentary approach to drug testing in general. You either have, you know, a four to one cutoff of a T to EPI T ratio plus synthetic anabolics. And if you're within that, it's kind of like a green light, you're fine. How often are they doing subsequent, you know, HGH, um, isoform differential amino assays? How often are they doing EPO testing? How often are they doing carbon isotope ratio testing? In general, they're not gonna be implementing those tests at all unless there is a red flag that then kind of justifies to pay the top dollars to do the subsequent high sensitivity testing that would then confirm without a doubt that they're indeed doing something. So a lot of these tests, even through the urine analysis, you're not actually picking anything up that's confirmatory or confirming. I don't even know if confirmatory is a word, to be honest. Hopefully it is, but if it's not, you know what I mean. So <laughs> you would like you can confirm for synthetics through urine testing, but through for actual bioidenticals, all you're doing is picking up red flags that then justify to spend more money to do high sensitivity testing. And at that point, could you get around the high sensitivity testing, even if you have aberrations above and beyond the scope of what these ratios can pick up? Like for example, if you have a 4.1 T to EPI T ratio and you get subsequently carbon isotope ratio test, but it comes out as clean and it's, you know, actually like matches the carbon isotope ratio of endogenously produced human testosterone, you're fine. You're not gonna get popped, even though you pass the ratio cutoff because it looks like it came from your ball sack rather than from an exogenous pinning in your ass. Now, how would you go about doing that? Well, is it that difficult to get cholesterol derived testosterone or react it down to actual testosterone and then inject it into yourself? Is it that hard to get a HGH preparation that has the isoforms in a ratio that is bioidentical in reality rather than just using a recombinant HGH that is sold over the counter, you know, in pharmacies and shit. You know, this is the kind of stuff that if you are a fucking goddamn like billion dollar athlete, you would imagine you have a guy on staff who is fully capable of potentially fucking making it himself or sourcing it through the correct avenue. So this is not something I would be surprised if it's being implemented in, uh, you know, among guys like Ronaldo, you know, this is the kind of stuff you're looking at and it is above the scope of what the testing can get. The budget can barely allocate enough funds to test these guys on a randomized, regular basis with very basic parameters and the subsequent high sensitivity tests can't even pick up if you're using bioidenticals prepared in certain ways for certain individuals based on certain genetic predispositions. This kind of shit is not being accounted for because there's simply not a budget for it, nor is the testing advanced enough to pick up this kind of stuff. So when it comes to the EPO, when it comes to the testosterone, when it comes to the HGH, when it comes to even some of the other shit your body will produce, and then some of the stuff they're not testing for, even in the synthetic realm, designer compounds, things that are nootropics that are just, you know, overlooked because they're so novel and new that they don't even fucking know about it or haven't developed an assay yet that is sufficient enough to pick it up or they haven't determined it's performance enhancing yet. This kind of stuff is definitely being leveraged by top athletes and there's definitely a reason why certain individuals are paying top dollar to have guys in their camp that literally are just oversee stuff. You know, LeBron pays how much out of pocket? A million dollars a year for a, a team to just oversee rehabilitation and, you know, potentially performance enhancement. Do you think that's a, do you think there's not a guy in there that is trying to optimize everything he possibly can from a pharmacology aspect? So as far as Ronaldo, does his progress look unnatural? Does he pass the, you know, the eye test? It looks natural. Like it looks like you could develop this amount of muscle within that time frame if you were a total newbie to lifting in the 20 year old before picks. Um, and then you start lifting and you gain, you know, 10 to 15 pounds of muscle. That's like perfectly reasonable to expect as a natural. Do I think he's not doing something though to enhance his hematology, to enhance his oxygen carrying capacity, to enhance what he's doing on the field from a um, force production aspect. Like, of course I would think he is probably implementing. He's like fucking how many millions of dollars is he making? Do you think he, if you knew for a fact you could pass a drug test because the drug tests were simply not advanced enough to pick up some of the shit you can afford to do, would you not be doing it? Of course you would. So I would not be surprised if he is doing this kind of stuff too, similar to my response with the LeBron video. However, some of the compounds in question would definitely be different for a, so a football player, soccer, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to be, <laughs> I try to specify football because again, 
Um, in the in North America, you hear football, you think you know what I mean. So, anyways, football player slash soccer for you know Americans who don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So, anyways, like yeah, like the drug selection, how you allocate it would definitely differ relative to you know a basketball player, for example. However, the same kind of approach to bioidenticals and the strategies involved to kind of circumvent some of these not advanced enough tests is definitely being implemented. So that is my opinion personally. So is he natty? No, I don't think so. You know, I think the progress from a muscular development aspect is certainly within the realms of being plausibly natural. But I don't think that's all it's boiled down to, you know? I think like from a performance aspect, what do these guys have to gain most from, you know, a something translating to actual performance on the field above and beyond just like, you know, anabolics for muscle tissue, mainly endurance, you know, mainly oxygen carrying capacity, mainly things that are going to be involved in phlebotic, you know, blood building, like shit like this is going to be one of the main aspects I would be looking at as a football player personally. And I imagine he is likely doing the same. Now that's not to say he's not using TRT. That's not saying he's not doing like HGH. Why the fuck would you not be using that as a football player? Injury proofing yourself, you know, improving the integrity of your fucking, like everything, you know, <laughs> like preventing injuries is like one of the main reasons you'd be using this. Um, it's not just from a fat loss lipolysis aspect. It's not just from a satellite cell proliferation myonuclear donation aspect. It is from a fucking protection aspect and preventing yourself from getting damaged on the field. And even if you do, your ability to rehab yourself is much more expedited. So this is the kind of thing I see as no brainer additions for these guys when it is pretty much free reign given their budgets and the ability to have pharmacology that is essentially undetectable. So anyways, that is my stance on it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. Much appreciated. If you wanna support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below my TRT clinic. It's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas, I design myself from scratch. My recommended lab tests and diagnostics to stay on top of your health and assess your hormonal status as well as basic health parameters and then you know if you want to get subsequent you know oversight and recommendations from our doctors at my clinic you know you can do that as well and see if hormone optimization is in the cards for you if it makes sense um and how to kind of move forward with any kind of goals you have realistically from a um, optimization quality of life health aspect so you can check that out if it is of interest to you and anything else I'm associated with, it is all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.